If you don't know how much joy it brings us every week to look out over the audience and see such a wonderful crowd of people and a good number of visitors, what we have with us every week, it really uh, does us a lot of good to know that you have interest in spiritual things. And we invite you to come back anytime that you have opportunity. We will meet tonight at 5. We meet Wednesdays at 7. Uh, and we'd love to have you come and be with us at any or all of those services. We say every week, and this is not just words, we mean this, if you have questions about what you see or hear, let us know about that. Uh, we have always tried and will continue to present God's Word in a clear, forceful, and plain fashion. Uh, we believe that that is what God would have us to do. And uh, if it, perhaps you say, we say something or you hear something or see something you don't understand, we'd be more than happy to discuss that with you. So thank you for coming. Uh, and open your Bibles now to Luke 15. That was the passage that was read just a few moments ago. And uh, this is the parable of the two lost sons. Sometimes people call it the parable, parable of the prodigal son, but there are actually two uh, sons in this parable. And we somehow have lost sight of that second son. But it says in the very first verse there, in verse 11, a certain man had two sons. There were two lost sons in this particular text. In this parable, we're going to camp out in this passage, so you might just mark that place in your Bible. Uh, but this parable is a favorite of many people. There are many Christians and many preachers as well who love this parable and love to preach from this parable. Now, I'll have to say that in all honesty, this is only the second sermon that I've ever had on this text. Uh, surprisingly, uh, many preachers have many, many sermons on this text, but this is actually only my second sermon on the text. But it is a great story. It is a great lesson. Uh, and it would do us good to spend some time in it this morning. Uh, the reason that Jesus told this parable and the two parables that precede it, there are three parables in Luke 15. Uh, the reason behind those parables is stated in the first two verses. In verses 1 and 2, it says, Then all of the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. The word receives there suggests the idea of welcoming. So Jesus was very welcoming to sinners and even had the audacity to eat with sinners. And people were complaining about that. And Jesus told three parables. He told the story of a lost sheep. He told the story of a lost coin. And then he told the story of two lost sons. And each one of them are designed to explain why he ate with sinners, why Jesus was not aloof, why Jesus uh, mixed and mingled with those uh, who the other, the Pharisees and others would look down their noses at, Jesus mixed and mingled with them. And of course that reason ultimately was to seek and to save the lost. In Luke 19 and verse 10, Jesus says that was his mission. He says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And you see, Jesus was on the mission of the Father. The Father sent Jesus or gave Jesus to do that particular mission. John 3.16, another favorite text, says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. So God, and in that text, John 3.16, God is clearly referring to the Father because He gave His Son. And so God the Father loved the world. And he gave his son. That was a demonstration of that love. And in Luke 15, really, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the love of the Father for a lost humanity. You and I have made a lot of mistakes in our life. We have rebelled against the God of heaven. That's what sin is all about. It's about rebellion against God. And everyone who sins, and that's everyone, everyone who sins is a rebel. And yet God loves you. And that's why Jesus ate with sinners. And that's why God is interested in our souls even today. But this text tells us a lot about the love of the Father. And that's the way we want to approach this text. We don't want to focus so much on the lostness of the boys as much as we do on the love of the Father. Because I think that's really the focus of Luke 15. And so let's talk about that. First of all, I would suggest to you that the love of the Father blesses even the rebellious. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Look with me in, the, in these first three verses. These were the verses Joel read just a little bit ago. It says, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. The word prodigal means wasteful and extravagant. And I love the way the New King James translates that because it reminds us of where the name for this parable comes from. And so this son wasted his inheritance. But, you know, this boy, he wants his inheritance early. Dad's not dead yet, and he can't wait. Father, I want my part now. 
uh, and I want to leave home, and I, and I want to just take my part of your inheritance that you're going to leave me, and I just want to do what I want with it, and I want to do it today. But that reminds us, and this is all designed to picture uh, man and God in their relationship with each other, and particularly God's love for man, but it reminds us that God is like that. He blesses even the rebellious. He sends, Jesus said, He sends His Son on the evil and the good. And He sends His reign upon the just and the unjust. We read about that in Matthew 5 when Jesus was talking about there in verses 43 through 45. He was talking about loving your neighbor and doing good for everybody. And He says God is like that. God sends His Son on the evil and the good and His reign on the just and the unjust. But you know, we take those blessings for granted. We want what God gives us, but we don't want to give Him anything in return. We would just rather do our own thing and let God continue to bless us. We breathe His air. We eat His food. Remember a couple of weeks ago we had the lesson uh, about how everything belongs to God. The earth is the Lord in all its fullness and everything is God. We breathe His air. We eat His food. We drink His water. And, and yet we go on our merry way and we have no regard many times for the love of God in, in providing those things for us. You see, God doesn't have to do that. He could cut all that off today if He wanted to. Uh, that is His right as our sovereign Creator. He could cut the food off. He could cut the air off and, and, and suffocate all of us. He could cut the water off. But no, you see, God loves us. And so He continues to bless us. And think of that, that He blesses us in spite of our rebellion. I think of the years that I spent wasted uh, wasted in sin, wasted in not serving God, wasted in not being a Christian, and yet God continued to send the air and the sunshine and the water. He continued to let me have a job and provide for my family and put a roof over our heads. He continued to uh, let me enjoy having my parents with me for as long as possible, and yet we squandered our time in rebellion. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. And you, if you're here this morning, and I don't mean to be unkind, but I'm just trying to make you think about the love of God. You, if you are mindless of God and you're not thinking about God, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Think about the great blessings that He's provided. Think about the love that He has for you. It's done out of love. And be ashamed that you've wasted time in not serving God. And think seriously about coming to the Lord. Think seriously about turning your life around and becoming a child of God this very day. You could leave this building today and be a child of God. What a great thought that is. It doesn't take but a moment to turn your life around and to become a Christian. But you know, there's another thing we learn about the love of God. The love of God will actually let us hit bottom, if that's necessary. In verses 14 through 16, it says, But when he had spent all, he took that inheritance from his father, and he went and wasted every bit of it. The previous verse says he wasted it on prodigal living. And when he had spent all, every dime is now gone. There arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Now, put yourself back in those days. Jesus is a Jew, and he is addressing Jews. And this prodigal son was probably a Jew, more than likely. Uh, at least that would, that would seem to be a logical assumption from the context in which this is all written. And a swine was an unclean animal. And so this man is reduced to feeding pigs. And this is very offensive to a Jew because they saw this as an unclean animal. And so he wasted all of these blessings and God allowed it the whole time. God allowed him, the father, the father of the story who represents God, allowed him to request that inheritance ahead of time, allowed him to walk away from home, allowed him to spend every dime of that, allowed him to go and feed pigs and didn't do a thing about it. Let that sink in. The father never intervened. He never went looking for the boy. He never intervened. He let the boy hit bottom. He let him hit rock bottom. And I'll tell you something, folks, that's good parenting advice. We would do well to think about that. Many times we as parents, and I understand the motive behind it because I have a child too, uh, but we love our kids so much that we don't do them any favors. We enable a child's rebellion by constant bailouts. Our children get into trouble and every time they're in trouble we're right there to bail them out again and again and again and again. And what we're really doing, if we stop to think about it, is enabling that rebellion. And we should stop and, and rethink that because God says, no, sometimes I just need to let you go and find out what it's like without me. Sometimes I need to let you hit the bottom. I was talking about something like this. In fact, this very thing, I was mentioning this sermon to my son the other day. And we were talking about 
uh, kids who sometimes are still at home, they're in their 30s and they're still living at home and they don't have a job and they're living off their parents. And, uh, and, uh, I, and uh, he said, Dad, you wouldn't throw me out, would you? And I said, I surely would. <laughs> I most certainly would. If you think you're going to be 35 years old and living with dad and not even trying to work, you will go out the door. Now I said, now that isn't going to be easy. It isn't going to be easy for a father to do. It wasn't easy for this father to do. It isn't easy for our heavenly father to do. But we're not doing them any favors when we're constantly bailing them out and not helping them to stand on their own. So it's good parenting advice. God is teaching us by example. There's a word for this in modern society. It's called tough love. That's what it's called. And I'll, and I'll be the first to tell you it's not easy. It breaks your heart. Uh, it breaks your heart to see your children out there struggling. It breaks your heart to see them out there suffering. It breaks your heart to see them reap the consequences sometimes of their very behavior. But it's necessary for the proper development of the character of a child. And it's necessary for the proper development of the character of a child of God as well. We're children of God. And even as children of God, sometimes we rebel against the Father. We have those times in our life when we turn away and we leave home. We've been at home with the Father. We're Christians and we're with the Father and then we choose to go away. Uh, and that happens even to Christians sometimes. And God, he, just know this, He will let you hit the bottom. He will, he will let you spend your life and waste your life in sin. He will let you scrape the bottom of the barrel. He will let you get to the point where, as it says there in verse 16, no one gave him anything. That's a miserable place to be, isn't it? But God will allow it. And you think, how could he do that? He loves you. This is the love of the Father. We have to understand that there are two sides to love. Love isn't always roses and cream and peaches. Love sometimes says, no, uh, you made this choice and you're going to live with the consequences of your choice. You're, you're going to hit bottom. You're going to suffer the consequences of your behavior. And God doesn't do that because He hates you. On the contrary, God does it because He loves you. And this hitting of the bottom is designed to wake us up. This hitting of the bottom is designed to get us to realize what we've done and to realize that we've made a serious mistake and it's time to go back home. It's time to return to the Father. And that brings us to our next section. In verses 17 through 19. The Bible tells us that the love of the Father is known to be compassionate. In verse 17 it says, And when he came to himself. Now let me just stop there and think about that expression. That's an interesting expression to me. He came to himself. And, and I stole this idea from D. Bowman. So if you don't like it, you can blame D. for it. But I heard him say this one time. He, he's, he talked about how in the morning when we get up, we go to the mirror. And what we're doing is coming to ourselves. You come and you see yourself in the mirror. And you see yourself exactly as you are. You wake up with bed hair. And, you know, your hair is sticking right up. And, nothing, and, you, and your face is dirty and perhaps you need to clean it off. But, but you see yourself. And that's the idea here. This man finally sees himself. That's why God let him hit bottom, by the way. God let him hit bottom so that he could see what he really was. And he could see what he was without God. And so he came to himself. He, he saw himself for what he really was. He saw what he had done. And he said, how many, verse 17, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I'm impressed with his humility. He doesn't want to be restored to sonship. He says, Father, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy just to be one of your servants. And think about what he must have been thinking as he, was in the, as he was in the field, as he was out there feeding the pigs. He said, boy, that pig food sure looks good. They devour it, and I'm starved to death. I sure would like to eat even, even that pig food. I'd eat it right now. I'm that hungry. And then he sits and he thinks, you know, back home, Bubby's eating. My big brother, he's eating. Dad's eating. Mom's eating. Well, even their field hands are eating. And if I stop and think about it, the animals are eating too. And here I sit in the, with the pigs, and here I sit starving to death, and here I sit nobody giving me anything, and I think I've made a mistake. I think it's time for me to go back. And you know, we, we may deny this in our rebellion, but things are always better off at home with the Father. Now in our rebellion we said, no, no, I wouldn't go back to the Lord for nothing. I wouldn't go back to the church for nothing. I wouldn't go back and serve the Lord. I'm happy out here. And we're, we're kidding ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. We know, deep down in our soul, we know it's better off back home. It's much better to just swallow your pride, get up, go back home, 
and humbly ask your Father for forgiveness. The Bible says to us in Romans 5 and verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us, and he doesn't just say, I love you. He shows it. He sent the demonstration in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. You've all seen and read those little uh, poems that, that get passed around the Internet. You know, Jesus, how much do you love me? And he says, I love you this much. And he spread out his hands and he died. That's a demonstration of love. It's not just words with God. He said it, but he also means it. He showed it. And, and here's the thing. This guy didn't have any doubts, at least I don't think he did, didn't have any doubts that his father would take him back. You know, I know if I go back home and I apologize, my dad is compassionate enough, my dad is loving enough, I, I was raised up in that home and I know him, and I know he'll welcome me back home. You see, the love of the father is known to be compassionate. He knew he could go back home. He didn't think for a second that his father would reject him. And that's great for us. We need to realize our heavenly father is like that. I don't care what you've done, folks. And some people have done a lot of terrible things. You know, I've talked about my past. I've just said a few cuss words, you know, maybe drank a beer or two. But there are people out there who've done some really bad things. There are people out there in the world who, who have been involved in bad crime, who've been involved in heavy drugs. But I'm telling you something, God will take you back. He loves you. And he wants you back. And he's waiting for you to come back. And you know that deep down in your soul. So I say to you, what in the world are you waiting for? Get up. Get out of the hog pen of sin. Come back home to the Father because He loves you and He will welcome you back. Now, that brings us to verse 20. The love of the Father waits for that rebel to come home. God's pacing the floor waiting for you. In verse 20, it says, And he arose and he came to his father. See, this boy didn't just talk about going home. He, he mustered up the courage, and he went back home to his father. But watch this. While he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Don't let it escape your notice that dad saw him while he was a long way off. See, that's, that was his boy. And we know our kids, don't we? We know their shape. We know their walk. We know their gate. Now, I don't think Father just sat there and fretted about the boy. I think he went on with his life. I think Father was working every day, but every day while he's working, he's looking along the horizon because I want my boy back home so bad I can taste it. And I'm looking. Is that my boy? No. No, that's one of my servants out there. Is that my boy? No, that's one of the animals out there in the field. Wait, there he is. That's my boy. I know that shape anywhere. I know that walk anywhere. And so he was waiting he was waiting. That implies that this father was anxiously waiting and anxiously anticipating the return of this son. And the father in heaven is still waiting for you. I've talked to people over the years, and this is a common question. I'm not being critical of the question. People say, well, why doesn't God just destroy the world? Everything is so bad and everything is terrible. What's he waiting on? Waiting on you. That's what he's waiting on. Waiting on you to come back. Now, God's not going to wait forever, but that's what he's waiting on. That's what the time is going by for. That's why this world continues to exist, because he's still waiting on you to return. Hold your spot here. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter 3, there are people who were asking the same question. Where's the promise of his coming? When's he coming back? Why, everything continues as it has since the beginning of creation. And he reminds them in verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. God hasn't forgotten His promise. And He's not going to renege on His promise. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, the, the ideal will of God is that everybody would get to go to heaven. That's really what he wants. Now, it can't happen that way because never, not everybody will come up out of the hog pen of sin and come back home. And they have to reap the consequences of their actions. But God, if he could have his way without making you a robot, without making you do his will, if he could have his way, everybody go to heaven. He's not willing that any, he doesn't want to send anybody to hell. He doesn't want to punish anybody. Rest assured, he will. But he doesn't want to do this. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all 
should come to repentance. This is because of love. He's waiting for you to come home. Here you are this morning. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you've been out there in the hog pen of sin. Maybe you're a Christian and you're not faithful and you've been back out there in the hog pen of sin. Come back. He's waiting for you. But he isn't going to wait forever. But right now, while you have this season, while you have this opportunity, take advantage of that. Take advantage of the love of God. God is compassionate. God is forgiving. God will welcome you back home, and He's waiting for you this very hour. And how in the world can you turn that down? Think of that. Closely related to that is this. The love of the Father fully forgives when we come back home. You know, there's a lot of folks who have this idea that God forgives regardless. That God forgives no matter what you do. Why, you can go ahead and live in sin. You can go ahead and dwell in sin. You can go ahead and be in rebellion and God will forgive you anyway. That's not the way it works. He will forgive you. But you've got to do something first. You've got to turn things around. You've got to get up out of the sinful hog pen and come back home. And so God, when you come home, will fully forgive. I want you to think about, once again, what this prodigal did. And what he was forgiven of. He was completely forgiven of wasting his entire inheritance. Now stop and think about that for a second. An inheritance, an inheritance. An inheritance technically isn't yours until your folks are dead. And in fact, a lot of folks have the idea, well, that, that inheritance is mine, period. I have a right to it. Well, no, no, you don't really have a right to it. If mom and dad wants to, they can write a will in such a way that all of their things are put in the street and burnt. You don't get a bit of it. They can do that. That's their right. It's their stuff. And so technically, what I'm saying to you is, this father, when he, when he gave this man his inheritance early, technically that stuff was still his dad's. Even to this very moment in the parable, it was still dad's stuff. And yet his boy took it out there and wasted it. And in fact, later on his son says, down here in verse uh, 30, he devoured your livelihood with harlots. So we know what he spent his money on. He spent his money on sin. Specifically here, harlots. So your money, your, your inheritance was wasted on harlots and you're going to let that boy come home? Oh, yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm going to let him come home because he's my boy. I'm going to let him come home because I love him. But he wasted his father's entire inheritance. That is his share of it. He wasted every bit of it. And it was technically still dad's. Now, there's a picture there of forgiveness on our part. Turn your Bibles to uh, Matthew 18. There's another parable about forgiveness, and we've looked at this many times before because it's such a beautiful and vivid depiction of the notion of forgiveness. In Matthew 18, verse 21, Peter came to Jesus and he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. Now, he's going to tell a parable to illustrate the nature of this forgiveness. And the king here in this parable is God, just as the father in this parable is God. The king in Matthew 18 is God. And he wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And when he was not able to pay, stop. He, the reason he's not able to pay is because this is a huge sum. Unless you're Donald Trump or somebody like that, you're not going to be able to make this kind of money. This man would never live long enough to make the money that he paid back. 10,000 talents was like 200,000 years of pay for a common laborer. And so he was not able to pay. And his master, and his master had every right to do this, as our heavenly master does, commanded that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and that payment be made. I'm going to sell you, I'm going to split the family up. I'm going to sell you off into slavery to somebody else. I'm going to sell whatever you've got and it's all going to come to me because you owe it to me. Uh, and so he, he had every right to do that. But the servant therefore fell down before him and he said, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Now, this debt is a picture of sin. Some of us, as I said earlier, have done some bad things. Some of us, maybe not so many bad things. But some of us have done some really, really bad things. And all sin is bad. There are no big sins and little sins. All sin is bad. It's all rebellion against God. It all leads to the same place. And yet God is willing to say, I don't care what it is. I don't care what that debt of sin is. I'm willing to wipe it clean. You see, the Lord ha has, has released us from that huge, unpayable debt of sin and more. 
He bore the brunt of that. You know, when that master, you've heard me say before, when that master forgave him that debt, who, who bore the hurt? The master did. And God, he bears the hurt in a couple of ways. First of all, he sends his son to die on the cross. And he bears that hurt. He bears the hurt of being the sacrifice for sin. And based upon that sacrifice, then he bears the hurt of saying, I release you. I know you've wasted. The, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. And I know you've wasted whatever I've blessed you with. And you've wasted the years and you've wasted the substance and you've wasted the time. Uh, but I, I forgive you. I let it go. It's a huge debt. And you and I, when that happens, we should fall down on our knees before God and say, thank you. Thank you, Lord. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your bodies. Notice the connection. You were bought at a price. The price being the precious blood of Christ. Therefore, you see that word there? He's connecting that up. Therefore, since the Lord died for you, therefore, since you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. It's not therefore go on your merry way and sin. It's not therefore continue on in your rebellion. It's not therefore stay out there in the hog pen of sin. It's therefore glorify God. Turn your life around. Come to the Lord. And that's very important. And that's precious. And that all comes back to the love of the Father. That's what's behind all of this. This is all telling us about the love of the Father. And there's another point. The love of the Father extends even to the self-righteous. You said we, we, earlier we talked about how it blesses the rebellious, but it also extends to the self-righteous. That's that other son I was telling you about. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry. And would not go in. And therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, who, was, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And dad said to him, Son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and alive again. He was lost and is found. Do you know that the son that stayed home was just as lost as the son that was out there in the hog pen? They were both lost. They were both lost sons. One lost and never left home. He thought everything was all right, but he, everything wasn't all right. And the saddest part is that he didn't even see his self-righteousness and he didn't see his jealousy. In verse 29, his self-righteousness. I've been serving you these many years. I have never transgressed your commandment. Oh, really? Really? There isn't a Christian in this room who can say that. Not a one. Not a one of us can say that. We've all transgressed God's law. The Bible is very clear about that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not as And yet this man is insisting, I'm the one who's never done anything wrong. It's that fellow, that son of yours. He didn't even call him his brother. That son of yours. He's the one who's done all the bad stuff and I haven't done anything. And so the father said, listen, I still love you. Everything I have is still yours. I, I'm not treating you any different. I'm not doing you any wrong. And you're still mine. But we need to accept this other brother back as well. Not only that, but this brother was filled with jealousy. Verse 30. As soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your live, livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. I, t I detect a little bit of jealousy there. You didn't give me and my buddies as much as a young goat uh, that we might make merry just, just to have fun because we're, we're the good kids. But this son of yours, when he comes back, you killed the fatted calf. That was important to the family. The fatted calf. You killed the fatted calf for him. And so he didn't see his self-righteousness. He didn't see his jealousy. And yet the father still loved him. You know, that's a picture of some brethren today. That is a picture. There are some brethren who act as if they've never sinned. They've never done anything wrong. And there are some who resent when brethren come back. I've seen that. I've talked to people like that. A brother will be out in sin. A sister will be out in sin. They'll come back to the Lord. And then there's always that other brother who comes up, that other sister who comes up and says, Are you going to take them back? Are you going to forgive them for that? Do you know what they did? And I can't even look at them. And I can't listen to them pray. And I can't stand to see them at the Lord's table because of the things they've done. What? 
God can stand to look at him. God can stand to see him at the head of the table. God can stand to listen to him pray. What's the matter with you? You see what I'm talking about? But if you're like that, God loves you too. He loves you too. He wants you to straighten that up. He wants you to stop that. But he loves you too. And so when we put this together, this is just a great story. And this really, I think, this is what the story is about. It's not about the sons as much as it is about the father. It's about the father seeking the lost. It's about the father waiting for that person to come back home. It's about the father loving him even when it's tough to love him. Even when he has to let him hit bottom. This is all about God. And so if I may, let me requote John 3.16 in, in my way of looking at it. For this is the way God loved the world. He gave his unique son that whoever trusts him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Don't let the love of the Father escape you this morning. Pay attention to it. And don't walk away from it. Embrace it. Come to the Lord. He will receive you. He will forgive you. If you're here this morning and not a Christian, put your faith in Christ Jesus. Repent of the sinful life you're living. Confess His holy name and be immersed in water. We have the baptistry back here and everything's ready and the only thing missing is you. Maybe you've done that already, but you've gone away from the Father. Come back home. He's waiting for you. He's watching for you. Come right now while we stand, while we sing.